you, everyone. Oh, it's so good to, uh, to see everyone back in here. Um, as Shalane said, uh, we spent some time in, in the springtime experimenting with uh, doing some encouraging discipleship online. And uh, so this is a historic night. So uh, as Cullen has called this, this is season two, but really it's our third experiment of trying to en encourage discipleship uh, wherever people are. So um, in, the, in the spring, we did it mostly uh, with alumni and students that were scattered, but uh, this, for this particular season of the 72 is we're doing this with, uh, we have our, our everyone, okay, let me back up. For the last 20 years, every Wednesday night at CLBI is D group night, and that's where we meet in staff homes and and we do our, our discipleship groups. We encourage each other in our faith. Sometimes we do outreaches. We do different things. And we also have alumni that are scattered about all over the place. And it's great having people in Asia, in Europe, North America. So we've got three continents. We've got four countries, I think, represented here tonight. And, um, and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is its own land, right, Shalane? That's where she is. And Eliana. Um, but tonight we have D groups happening at CLBI mixing together with people all over the place. And our goal in this is to encourage people to follow Jesus. That's what it's about. So we have, uh, if you, it doesn't matter if you've never gone to CLBI, we want to equip each other and encourage each other uh, in discipleship. And so uh, this is going to be a great journey together. Uh, some people have asked, how long are we doing this? Do I have to, like, am I signing up for the rest of my life? No. You're welcome to join us for a long time. Uh, but it's, there might be an ebb and flow of this if, if in people's real-life schedules. Uh, but you, we at CLBI, we are doing this until the end of April. So you're welcome to join us. Uh, we also have people that are uh, kind of putting groups together, and it's going to be a slow launch of groups. Uh, we are mentoring leaders. We're training leaders. I love it. We've got people that are like people that are 20 years old who are leading a group, and they have got a co-leader who is twice their age, and that's beautiful. And so there's going to be uh, some great equipping going on. So um, those of you that have, let's just, yeah, those who are, you're seeing multiple Let's see, where are the CLBI D groups oh, right yeah. now? Just wave. If you actually have, you should have eight groups. There's probably nine cameras there. Uh, those are the ones that are they're currently uh, um, doing some groups. And uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. We have uh, some professors that couldn't, some instructors that couldn't come up to CLBI to teach us here. Ben Unseth. Uh, ben, uh, we've, you're locked in the States. Where are you living right now, Ben? You have to unmute, classic Zoom thing to say. Sorry, I'm in Mankato, Minnesota, an hour southwest of Minneapolis. Lovely, lovely. And Ben is typically up teaching intro to scripture. So uh, it snows every year when I come. And this year, would, it have, <laughs> would I have gotten in on snow this year? <laughs> no, not this year, thankfully. So, uh, but that's to come. That's to come. So, um, so uh, we, this is our first night. So a little bit of housekeeping things um, as, man, I don't need to explain Zoom. Everybody's muted. That's, uh, that's good stuff. And so the way that we're going to work this is that Mackenzie is our admin. And so he's going to be, after we do our, our group part, he'll be sending us into our, uh, our discipleship, our D groups. Let's just call it like, like it is. And so just to help him, to divide things up. Um, so this is our first night. So not everyone knows what group they're in. Um, Brant, you can see his, his uh, it says one dash Brant. So some of you, if you know that you're in uh, Brant's group, um, you need to change your name. So it's the number dash and then there. And then you see Lauren is leading number two. So to dash Lauren. So if you know if you're in Lauren's group, then write, change your, your, your screen name to to dash and your name. If you don't know what group you're in, that's fine. Mackenzie will just put you in one of those groups. And, uh, and then do we need to create, and then we have all of our CLBID groups and there's eight of them. And 
Mackenzie knows who you are. Um, do we need to make more groups? Uh, yeah, I think we got about 15 people who aren't from CLBI. Uh, so, okay, let's Elaine make and Eliana, would you mind leading a group tonight together? Okay, so let's awesome. So let's do three dash Shalane. So uh, if you can do that, Shalane. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the first walk and we do this is a little bit of some moving pieces as we put it together. And, uh, and there's some people that are, are trying to leap, they're trying to grow a group in their local church. Like Eliana, I see Eliana and Maddie in Saskatchewan and their group. And Eliana is trying to grow a group there locally. And so that is our prayer, our hope, is that people eventually, well, it's a, it's a pandemic, so it's a little weird, but, you know, that we can actually get people locally around, you know, face-to-face. -face. And um, my group's a little different because I've got one, two, three, four, there's five of us, and I've got Cyril in Switzerland, so we have one person joining us virtually. So, um, but I'm going to put that to you right now. Is there someone... Uh, I want you to pray about this. Is there someone that you would like to invite to join you um, in, your, in this journey of following Jesus? Someone who may be new to the faith or curious about it, or someone who's been in, in your church for many years. Someone that, um, so that, and, and you can invite them in a, in a very simple way. Just like, hey, I, I, I need... I need some people to walk with me in learning to follow Jesus. Uh, will you join me in this, this D group and, and just, just tell them, come try it out, see if you like it. That's probably the easiest way to do it because it's kind of complicated to explain what we're doing. Um, for this journey going forward with you guys, uh, we have a couple of resources that we're using. So we've got people all over the world and we want to be united by God's word. And so I've got, a book here uh, called Seeking God's Face. You can see it there. It's available on Amazon. And uh, this is a, a daily office. Just, it's scripture, reading scripture. And I know many of you are using it already. And so what's exciting about this is that we can be just um, following scripture together. It's like we're all watching the same movie and we get together and we get to talk about it. Because like the Mandalorian comes out on October 30th and a bunch of us are going to be watching it. And then we're going to be talking about the Mandalorian and, and singing the theme song. It's going to influence how we see the world for a while. I'm a big fan. But in the scriptures, um, right now, we're reading about Solomon and or Samuel. And so that is, this is the movie that's going through my mind. And uh, I just gave a, this book to Jenya Rust. Uh, Jenya Rust is a uh, alumnus of CLBI and she's serving in Haiti and she's flying out any day now and she's excited to join us. And so as she serves in Haiti, she's going to be walking with us uh, in the scriptures. And so we can be just learning. The, God is going to be sp speaking through his word to all of us. So please pick up this book, order it. It's a good one. Uh, there's another resource we're using. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. This is the way. Yes, this is the way. Thank you. Um, Mandalorian little reference there. Uh, there's another book that we're using, uh, Joining Jesus on His Mission, and Greg Finke is the author. And so there's, um, this is a beautiful book. Uh, we actually created a podcast called The 72, and uh, we interviewed um, Greg Finke on there. And as Ted was talking to him about, uh, about his book, uh, he, he was like, he was very modest. He's like, yeah, there's nothing really new there. Jesus said it all. You know, so he's basically kind of, we, there's a, there's so many approaches we could take to discipleship. And so we've chosen to, hey, let's, let's lean on great thinking and his work. And that's going to shape how we do this. I compare it to be like, if there's any archers out there, and you know, on the, on the end of the arrow, they have little feathers, the fletchings on there. And so what, if those on there, they kind of keep the arrow going straight. And so Greg's work kind of helps give some shape to, to where we're going as we disciple. And so it's going to be very exciting, very exciting. So we got a couple books. So that was my little intro there. And so um, um, 
part of this book. The title is Joining Jesus on His Mission. And so I've invited Charles Jackson um, to share tonight. Uh, Charles is a friend of mine. Uh, I've known Charles for years, and he is the uh, director of a group called World Mission Prayer Lead. Um, and maybe I'll let him explain a little bit about what that is. My working definition, I'll just say a little bit, though. They pray to send people into missions, you know. And so I asked Charles to come and to share about God's heart for the world. So, he's, so each night there's going to be some teaching, about 20 minutes of teaching. And it'll follow the themes in joining Jesus on his mission. Now, I encourage you to pay attention to how the Spirit is speaking to you through that. And if something, you know, stands out, make a little note, write it down. And because when you get into your D groups later, we can talk about that. But when we get into our D groups later tonight, um, you may not, God may be have something else that he wants you to talk about. Something else how God's getting your attention. And it might be something really exciting that happened to you today. Or it might be a trigger that happened and God's wanting to shape you still. So you're not bound to just talk about uh, what Charles has got to say. Because I know sometimes I'm in, oh yeah, here's the thing. When I'm, I, when I'm preaching and uh, when people after church ask me, hey Dean, uh, that was a great sermon. And I always say back, oh, which one did you hear? Because God always customizes messages. There's how many of us on here? Whatever is 60 people here tonight. Um, God will, will customize it. Um, Mackenzie, did I cover all? <coughs> did you cover? Uh, I think so, yeah. You think so? Okay. Yep. So um, let's pray, and then we'll uh, give this over to... Uh, oh, Ben's got a question? You have yeah, a question? which seeking God's face, Ratzinger or Reinder? Oh, goodness. Of course, One that looks like this. Um, oh, Brian Philip F. Reinders. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize there's more than one. Yeah. So it's good. It's a daily office text. Good. So we're excited about this. I love how we have people from all over the world. Uh, we have uh, different generations represented tonight because we need to hear from each other. Uh, this is the beginnings of, uh, or it's not the beginnings, God is, is expanding this movement of making disciples. And so we're excited to be part of that. So as Jesus sent out the 72, that is us. We are part of his, his team, his disciples. So let's pray and then we'll give it over to, uh, to Charles. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together tonight. And thank you for Charles and Holy Spirit. We ask that you will fill him that you will speak through him, Lord, and um, pray, Holy Spirit, that you will give us a glimpse of how you are at work in the world. Give us a bigger picture of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Charles, give it over to you, and make sure you talk about what's going on on Friday night. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charles Jackson. Uh, I, as Dean said, I am the Executive Director for World Mission Prayer League. I was in, uh, I was pastor in just south of Camrose for about six, seven years. Then I was a uh, global worker. We tend to not use the word missionary now for all kinds of political correctness and sometimes more than political correctness, whether, we, it, whether it'll even allow us to get into some countries. Global worker in Kenya, Africa where I worked with the Samburu people. My wife and I, Anita, worked with the Samburu people until 2000, end of 2008. And then we went to Mongolia, where we were working there from 2010 until 2017. Um, yeah, I belong to an organization called World Mission Prayer League, and it actually was formed from a bunch of LBI students. Uh, reading the Word of God, and as they were doing it, uh, reading it, they just were captured by the Word, and through that, they're saying, well, wait a minute, this Word compels us to do something for others, and uh, the response to that was actually not to run out and be missionaries, but to actually, and I will actually turn my video off so you can see my, you can't quite see it there unless you've got full screen, 
It's a combine. And on the words, uh, in the words in the corner of the combine are, um, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers to the harvest field. My brother is a farmer. That was his combine out there. They're literally finishing up tonight. And there's nothing much more exciting than being part of the harvest. Today, uh, as Dean said, I want to talk a little bit about God's heart for the world. And I am just to keep me on track a little bit, but also to give you some Bible verses that you can see so you don't have to write it all down. I'm going to share my screen. Don't, if you have, uh, if you want to see other people, make sure that you minimize or make not, don't make real big what uh, my slideshow, you can see one another. And if you have a question while I'm going that you really, that you missed something or I didn't explain it well, can you, uh, write in the chat and and Mackenzie, can you like unmute yourself and say, hey Charles, we got a good question here because I probably won't be able to get the chat. If we yeah, I can do that. Great. God's heart for the world. What is God's heart for the world? God's heart. Um, we uh, in your book you're looking at God's mission or Jesus' mission to the world. Um, mission sometimes has a bad word in people's mouth, uh, but however, in the corporate world, we don't have a problem with mission statements. So the idea of where are you going and how are you going to get there? What's God's mission for the world? And right from the beginning of scripture, we see that God's heart for the world, God's mission for the world is that people know him. And then you see from the beginning of scripture where God calls Abraham and he says, I want to bless the world. And I want to bless all people through Abraham. And he says, I will bless you. And uh, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the end of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Go from your country. Go from your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To me, there's a, there's a key revelation in that passage from Genesis 12 that, one, God wants to bless people. That's God's heart and God's desire to be a blessing. However, we do see that there is also a flip side to it, that sometimes that people end up on the bad side of God. And we'll talk a little bit about that ago because that is also part of God's heart for the nations. He actually, sin breaks his heart. And, uh, and he, when it breaks his heart, and when we break one another's heart, God, wants, God needs to deal with it. But his desire, his heart, is to bless people. And I would say that, that would resonate with all of us. I long to be a blessing. Uh, when I'm in family gatherings and it's not going well, you're wondering, what can I do to fix it? When there's conflict, I want to see stuff. I don't know about you, but I hate conflict. And I just want to see people coming together, experience God's blessing and peace. All the way through scripture until the very last book. And we see the context of what blessing looks like in the kingdom of God, where John the author writes, after this, in the kingdom of heaven, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count. And from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne before the Lamb, and they were clothed in white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. In the Westminster, Westminster Catechism, it says, it says, what is the chief end of people it is to... To, to glorify God, to, to love God and glorify him ever. That's what our, we're made for. We're made to glorify God. But in this passage of Revelation, the neat thing is, it's there is um, the multitude, too great to count, but it says from every nation and every tribe, every ethnic group, every people, every language, that our differences, we're not some great cosmic light that we all get joined back into the, the, the cosmic God light, we're identified by nations and tribes and peoples and language groups before the throne of the Lamb. That God has in fact made us who we are, but he, we brought into unity, we're brought into that peace and into that place 
uh, where God says, you are experiencing my blessing. From the beginning to the end, God's heart for the world is that we might experience his blessing and we might live as people and be a blessing to one another. And that comes when we note and, and, and our focus is on the Lamb. And I just like that. They were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Can you, I, I, you're all muted, stay muted, but can you all just yell out with a great roar? Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. What does God feel when he sees the people word? What does God's, what happens to God's heart when he sees the refugees on the boats when he sees the children whose bodies are washed up on the shore because they did not make it? What does he see when he sees the slums and the brokenness in some of our huge cities? What does he see when he sees terrorism? When he sees racism? When he sees intolerance? What does God feel when he sees the people of the world? God's heart, I think, is broken when he sees his people broken. In, uh, in the, in the, uh, in after, right after the, or right before the, the word to Abraham, there's the story of Noah. And in the story of Noah, Noah, uh, the Lord looked down on earth and he saw the evil, the brokenness of the world. And it says, and the Lord was grieved that he had made us. I just can't imagine God's heart being grieved that he made us, but it grieves him when we are broken with one another, when we practice evil against one another, and when we practice evil against him. In Romans 1.18, it says, But God showed his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. I, I sometimes am I'm confronted quite a bit, and, and especially coming back to Canada, this idea is that God is all loving and he just accepts everybody the way they are. And Romans 1.18 clearly says it. But if you go back to that picture, when you see the brokenness, I would be very annoyed with God if he accepted everybody for what they do. Because there's a whole lot of evil in the world. One of our projects works with, uh, with human, traffic, uh, human trafficking. Uh, they're rescuing young girls and young boys who are sold into slavery out of Nepal. And it breaks God's heart and it should break our hearts. And in fact, it more than breaks God's heart, he gets angry. And God shows his anger from heaven. Gets it. You know what? It, and we get angry about it because it looks unjust. How much more does God get angry when he sees our, us hurting one another, when he sees us breaking community, when he sees hatred towards one another because of our selfishness? And of course, it comes back to we're all selfish too. When we try to do things and we try to make other people like us to be tolerant like us, we are just as intolerant as the people often as we condemn. What does God feel? God feels anger. God feels uh, his grief. It said he feels sorrow. What does he do about it? Well, his answer in, the, in three chapters later, or two chapters later, uh, chapter 3, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glory standard, yet in God's grace, he freely makes us right in his sight. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right before his sight when they believe in Jesus. What does God want? What is God's heart for us is he wants to make us righteous. He wants, to, he wants to save us. He wants us to make us right in his sight. We cannot make ourselves right in, in our own sight. In uh, Isaiah, it talks about uh, all our deeds are like filthy rags. 
And it's actually, uh, if you want to be, uh, take it more in the vernacular, all our deeds are like tampons, used tampons. And it's like trying to clean ourselves up by rubbing them all over ourselves to wash ourselves down. We make ourselves more, more dirty than we were before. And God wants to make us right. He wants to clean us. He wants to make us right. This is what God wants when he sees people of the world. He wants for us to have shalom. I find this a powerful word uh, throughout my ministry. He wants us to be, shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, but it's more than just peace. It means wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity, carrying with it the implication of permanence, being reconciled with God and being reconciled with one another. God, God's heart for the world is that we would have shalom and we would be people of shalom. That we would have a living relationship with God in whose image we are created. These life-giving relationships with those that God created. Shalom. What would it look like for you to wake up each morning experiencing wholeness and Completeness, that you are right with God, that the world is right around you. For those of you who are at CLBI this year, you a lot of you are longing and looking for community, and you're going to be excited about that. But there's going to be lots of mornings you're going to get up and you're going to go, I can't believe that my, you won't, I guess you don't have roommates, but my neighbor or another student has done this, and we all experience conflict. And God wants us to know shalom. And that shalom comes from him. It's that none should perish. There are about 2 billion people who will never hear about Jesus Christ. Shalom comes from the Prince of Peace, from God who offers himself to be the peacemaker, to reconcile us to himself. Shalom does not come when we make it. Shalom, when we want to try to fix things, when we want to make things right, shalom doesn't come from within us because it's from without us, from, it's from outside of us. It comes from, if it comes from within us, it's selfishness. I want other people to have shalom the way I think they should have shalom. And we find ourselves, that image is so limited and so narrow that we don't actually get to the image that God wants for us. And it's when shalom is, is given to us by God and that we speak out of that, that in fact others around us experience shalom because we're not compressing them into our image of what peace should look like, but they're experiencing the fullness of God what wants them to look like and what we want to look, uh, what we should look like. That we're both experiencing the wholeness and fullness of God uniquely that God has given for each one of us. But there's going to be there are right now about two two billion people that will never know God's shalom. They'll know a religious shalom, but religion is us seeking, us seeking to make ourselves right with God. And even lots of times in Christianity, it, we treat it like a religion. It's what can I do to make God happy? And when it's us trying to make God happy, it comes back to my deeds are like filthy rags. It comes back to us trying and our effort, and it always falls short. And we know it falls short. We kick ourselves. We say, well, did they like it? Do they like me? Am I respected by my... And we find ourselves not experiencing God's shalom. It's because it's his gift to us. We experience it when we, when, as, as, uh, as Roman said, when we believe in him. We experience it when we walk in uh, the promise that he gives us in baptism, that we die to selves so that we can be lived, living for him, which leads us to living with a purpose. God's shalom is that we are commissioned. We actually have a, on, um, in, in World Mission Prayer League, those who belong to World Mission Prayer League, we talk about we make a commitment to commissioned living. That, meaning, that means for us living within the needs of what we have, not living uh, extravagantly. That means living in community. That means living in the covenant that God has made for us and accounting others needs before ourselves and shalom comes when we live in community when we're empowered to share our gifts 
You know, and all too often missions has been, and even lots of times when you go out, it's the have sharing with the have nots. Look at what we have. Look at what we've brought to them. Even sometimes when we've done our Mexico trips, it's going to look at what we can do for these people. And it's us sharing with them. But that actually diminishes them and it diminishes us as a result. But when we live in a community in the way that each of us have something that God wants you to, us to contribute to the whole, what do they have that we're missing? And what do we have that God would have us offer to them? That when we see needs, we recognize we have needs that those people in other communities at other parts of the world have, uh, those other uh, cultures, those other uh, language groups, those other nationalities have, that can make us more whole and more complete when we come to know them. God's heart for the world is that none should perish. He does not desire the death of any, the death of the wicked does not make him happy. He desires that we live with purpose, that we live commissioned life, commissioned with Jesus to go out and live our lives. He, he desires us to live in community, to share our gifts with others and to have them share their gifts with us because all of our gifts from God come from God and they make us his whole people. I hope that gives you something to think about. It just begins to touch about what I see on the need. Um, I could share a story. Maybe as a final, final part, I will, I will just share um, a story. When Anita and I first met, went to the mission field, um, we went out. We, had, we, we uh, drove five hours across the bush, and we ended up being dropped off at this place with the chief. He had his gun, and he was walking to us. He was half drunk, and he was pointing at us. He goes, yeah, we'd like to have some white guys come and stay with us. Yeah, you'll bring some education and, and health care. And we're just going, what have we gotten ourselves into God? And my, Anita, she was, she was ducking down like this. I don't want to get in the way of his gun at this we drove back to, uh, to one of our co-workers' house that night, and we, uh, they didn't have any room in their house because they're full, so we had a tent outside, and the last thing he shared before we went out, he said, he says, oh, by the way, check for snakes underneath your tent in case they crawled in underneath your tent before you go to bed. And we went, oh. and Anita, she, she does not, she, she's afraid of, deathly afraid of snakes. And she gets outside, she wouldn't go in the tent, and she started to cry. And she said, I don't think I can do this, Charles. I prayed all my life to be a missionary. I don't think I can do this. We prayed that night, and that morning, the next morning we got up, and I said, you know what, I don't think we can. But God can. And her prayers changed that night from, God, what, can, what would you have us do for these people, to God, Give me your eyes for the people here. And if anything, if that would become your prayer, Lord, give me your eyes for the world. Give me your eyes for the community you put me in. Give me your eyes to see people the way you see them, that I might have your heart for them. Charles, thank you very much. I just love that. So before we go into our D groups here, what is one word that you're hanging on to? Something that God is getting your attention from, from what Charles is sharing. Just think about that. Yeah, yeah, Janik, it was the same for me, Shalom. And that I get to uh, involved in that God, that's God's peace for the world and for me. And uh, we get to find, get to, to lose life just about ourselves and we get to find real life. Man, that's rich. So good. Man, love you all. And we've been praying for this moment. And I know Jesus is really enjoying tonight. This is who we thought. So let's, uh, Mackenzie, you can. I'm going to give the signal. You can send us on our way. Are you ready, Mackenzie? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so um, uh, so how this works is, yeah, we'll go into our D groups, and then uh, that's where we end. 
and uh, some of the leaders, they come back after for what we call the after party, just for leaders to talk how it went. And, um, and that's where a lot of the learning happens. This is about training and equipping people to disciple others. And so you've heard a lot about CLBI tonight, but this is not about CLBI. It's about what um, Charles was talking about, Jesus' mission for the world. So as much as we can just train up people, equip them, and send them out, that is our goal, to multiply um, disciple makers. And so we want to support this. So God bless you all. Enjoy your D group. And uh, invite people who want to join us next week, and we'll keep just slowly launching groups as, uh, as the Lord brings people. Cool.